take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We are going to read verses 18, 19, and 20. We'll read verses 18 together. I'll read verse 19, and we'll end reading verse 20 together of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 18 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Ready? Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture. Uh, here this evening. I pray, God, that you would continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word tonight. Lord, I pray that each of us would have the spiritual ears to hear what the Spirit would say to each of us this evening as you speak to us as a church. And so, Lord, bless the special now, and Lord, make our hearts in tune with your heart, please. In Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning, in the form of God, with just one word, you sang creation's song. But when by sin, humanity was marred, you took on flesh to save a world gone wrong. You are the Christ, Son of the living God, my no other name deserves my praise. You are my life, my all, and I belong to you. At Calvary, the soldier shows the nails to fasten you upon the cruel tree. The hammer drove into your sinless hands. The nails you chose to pay the penalty. You are the Christ, Son of the living God. My rebel heart and mercy you pursue. No other name deserves my praise. Pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer as we once again come to open up your word together this evening. Lord, we ask for your help as we come to this time of opening your word and studying it together and proclaiming its truth. I pray, Lord, you would help me and give me the words I need this evening and guide my thoughts and I pray that give me clarity as I speak. I pray you'd help the people as they listen together this evening. Lord, I would be led by the Spirit as I speak, and they would be led by the Spirit as they listen. And that your will would be accomplished in each one of our lives tonight. And we would, all of us, be willing to allow you to make adjustments in our attitude, in our spirit. And so, Lord, have your way in each of our hearts, please. In Jesus' name I ask it, amen. Can you hear okay back in the back? Can you hear all right? Because I, my, uh, with the, with the services today in, in the last eight days, counting eight days, it's 16 times that I've preached in the last eight days, and so my voice is feeling it, and uh, so I hope you bear with me tonight, and uh, everything will hold up well, but I appreciate you praying for me. And uh, there's a lot of, with the radio broadcasts and with the prison ministry and with the normal services of the church, it's a lot of speaking uh, in a week. And uh, so I, I appreciate your prayers uh, for us. And uh, on that behalf, I, I thank you for that in advance. Now, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I want you to, to, to understand something. And we've, we've gone over some of this before, but I want to remind you of it. Uh, man is a three-part being. What is man made up of? Body, soul, and spirit. That's how we say it. You know, God never puts it in that order in the Bible. Every time God lists in the Bible, He always says spirit, soul, and body. Hey, it's funny how we always put the body first, because that's, that's how we are. And, uh, but God always says it's your spirit, soul, and body. But we're, they call that a trichotomy, all right? Man is a tripart being because we're made in the image of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, three, but one. We are three, but one. All right? We're made in His image. Now, we understand that our, our body is the, the outward, the shell that we see, uh, that we recognize people by, is their body. The soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. That makes up your soul. In other words, what you think, your mind, what you feel, your, your heart, and what you want, your will. Okay? And uh, then your spirit, which is... I'll say more about your spirit in a minute and understand that. But I want you to know when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God said, the day you eat of the tree, you will surely die. Now, did they die physically? No, they did not. What died that day? Their spirit died. And so every man from that point, when they're born, is born with a body and born with a soul, but born with a dead spirit. And that's why Jesus said, you must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is what? Spirit. See, that part of you that is born again is your spirit. And when you accepted Christ as your Savior, your spirit came to life. And you became a spirit, soul, and body once again that God intended back in the Garden of Eden for man to be. And that has been restored once you get saved. When you're lost and you're without Christ, all you are is body and soul. And so every lost person lives after the flesh. When the Bible says you live after the flesh, it simply means your soul is leading your body. What you think, what you feel, and what you want. And that's how you live. Now, can you be saved and still live after your soul? Yeah, you can. That's why there's what the Bible calls carnal Christians. Paul told the church at Corinth, I can't write unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, fleshly. You're being led by your soul. You're not being led by your spirit. God intends that we not be led by our soul, but that we led by our spirit. You see, 
the part of us that God speaks to is our spirit. Romans 8 and verse 16, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. He doesn't bear witness with your soul. He doesn't bear witness with your body. He bears witness with your spirit. Paul said in Acts 17 when he was in Athens that his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city given to idolatry. And his spirit got stirred up. And so uh, it's incredibly important to guard our spirit. You know, when I mentioned this morning, I don't remember if it was a morning service or Sunday school, about being in church in January of 1977 when I heard Roscoe Brewer uh, preach a message in the young people's department at the Canton Baptist Temple about God needs men and God needs men and God needs men. And, uh, and, and, and God stirred my spirit that morning. And, and I wanted to do something for God with my life. And I surrendered that day to, to do whatever God wanted me to do. And it wasn't long after that I went away to Bible college. And, and I crammed four years of Bible college into five. And, um, and, and yet, you know what? Never got discouraged. Didn't get despondent. Never, why? I, I, I was stirred in my heart to do something for God. I was anxious. I was, I was eager to learn and eager to take in all I could so I could one day go out and preach, go out and pastor a church and try to be used by God in some way. And so you understand, it's importantly, it is very important to guard your spirit. Now listen, when someone has a bad attitude, they have a bad spirit. Often in the Bible, the way you're going to reveal what kind of spirit you have is you reveal it by your attitude. Sometimes they're interchangeable depending on the context of the Scripture. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 20, For ye are bought with a price, and that price, by the way, was the blood of Jesus Christ, as he died on the cross. Therefore, glorify God. Uh, make, make sure you make God look good. Make sure you put God in a good light. How? In your body and in your what? Spirit. And in your attitudes. See? Which are God's. Now, a lot of times we're good at, at waxing eloquent on, you know, glorifying God with your body. And we talk about what, how to treat your body and what to eat in your body, what to put in your body, what not to put in your body. And you talk about smoking and drinking and all those things. But we often neglect the other part. And your spirit. I've met Christians over the years who certainly if you looked at them bodily wise, you would say, well, they're trying to honor God with their body, but boy, their spirit is horrible they don't have a very good spirit critical and and abrasive and difficult and you understand i'm to glorify god not just in my body but in my attitudes as well it's not just my positions but my dispositions that i'm to glorify god so guard your spirit one thing I have to work on, and in fact, years ago now, uh, there was a time when, when I would listen to talk radio, uh, the, the, the Glenn Becks and the Rush Limbaugh's and those guys, and you know what I noticed? It was affecting my spirit. And I decided, you know what, I, I can't listen to those guys anymore. And, and, may, and now it may be a snippet here or a snippet there when I drive in a car, but I don't tune them in anymore. You know why? It affected my spirit. And if it affects my spirit, it'll affect my spirit when I, when I stand up here on Sunday and Wednesday to deliver the Word of God to you. And if I don't, guard my spirit. And so it's important to guard your spirit. Now, let's look at your Bibles tonight and let's see some things about our spirit, our attitude that we have to watch out for. Look at Proverbs, please. 14. Proverbs 14. And if you're there in Proverbs, right after Proverbs, there's a little book called Ecclesiastes, and put a finger in Ecclesiastes 7. We'll go to Proverbs 14, and then we'll go to Ecclesiastes 7. 
Here's some spirits that we need to guard against or attitudes we need to guard against. Proverbs 14, and look with me please at verse number 29. The Bible says, He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Notice, hasty of spirit. The first spirit you have to guard against is a hasty spirit. A hasty attitude. Ecclesiastes 7, and look with me in verse number 9. The Bible says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Most of us know hasty means to be quick or to be in a hurry. Alright? And it's, it's really the opposite of deliberate. And that's, that is, listen, if you're not going to have a hasty spirit, you, you have to do it on purpose. Because we live in a hurry-up world. If you don't think so, the, the nanosecond the light doesn't turn green, just sit there for a second. And you'll realize people are in a hurry. And they'll let you know that they expect you to go the moment that light turns green. And get out of the way. We're in a hurried world. We're always looking at the watch. We're always wondering what time it is and what time is this and what time do I need to be here and what time do I need to be here there. And, and it's, a, it's a hurry up world. I, I really noticed it. And, and you notice it, I'm sure Brother Yoder does, when uh, I noticed when we went to the Philippines. They're not near in the hurry I am. And uh, these other countries, they don't. Uh, you, you realize how, how hasty we are in America. Uh, you know, you'll... You, you may go to a restaurant, and if there's a line, forget it. You're going somewhere else. You're not going to wait. Uh, if there's a 20-minute wait or 30-minute wait, you say, we'll go somewhere where we don't have to wait. We, we don't like, uh, we like getting things fast. Now, an example in the Bible of someone who I thought had a very hasty spirit would be someone like Esau. Esau came in from hunting, and he was very hungry, and uh, there's uh, Jacob making some uh, pottage, some soup, so to speak, and and uh, he thinks he's going to die. And, and he says, go ahead, give, it, give me that soup. Well, what cost you your birthright? Oh, fine, whatever. See? Boy, that's a hasty decision, isn't it? You think that was well thought out? You think that was very deliberate? No. In fact, he really regretted that decision. And most of us can think about times in our life when we were pretty hasty to make a decision and had some regret later that we were hasty in making that decision. Almost everybody's had an a occasion, whether it's the vacuum cleaner salesman or the car salesman, and you get home and you look at each other and think, what did we just do? <laughs> he just convinced us to buy something. I don't think we even wanted it. And uh, you, you say, don't we have three days to cancel this thing? You know, And uh, you try to get out of that decision uh, that you made. But can I remind you that Joseph spent 13 years in Egypt till God promoted him? He never got hasty. Can I remind you that Moses spent 40 years on the backside of the desert before the burning bush and God used him to deliver Israel? We get in such a rush. Parents, don't, don't rush your children. You know, we, we let, them, let them be kids. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, 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 could, I could pull over and park there, but I'll, I'll just try to... I'll just try to run through that, all right? But we, we seem to rush to, to, to get them to school, and then we rush to get them to high school, and we rush to get them, uh, they, they, they rush to graduate, and they rush to college, and then they rush to date, and rush to get married, and rush to have a home, and rush to get more stuff, and they go in debt to do it. And the problem is, we're just always going and rushing, and as we said this morning, grabbing for the next thing. And you know what happens? We never enjoy the thing, we never enjoy what we have. You know, uh, don't give your children things to look forward to. Don't, don't, go, don't go putting makeup on your four- and five-year-old. Don't, don't go doing things that, that they need to wait for. They need to, to wait. I think by the time they're 25, they could wear a little makeup. <laughs> and uh, by the time they're 30, they could start dating. <laughs> but... Um, but, you know, you, you have to teach them to enjoy where they are. You know, it's, it, it's normal for a kid when you're, 
you know, when you're in third grade and fourth grade, you're looking up to the sixth graders, and you can't wait to be sixth grade, but you get sixth grade, and you're looking up to the junior hires, and, and your junior hires, you're looking up at the high schoolers, and you're always looking up to somebody else and looking ahead to something else, but don't forget to enjoy where you are. Otherwise, you get that hasty spirit, and you'll regret, you'll never live, you'll never enjoy where you are right now. Stop rushing. Don't, don't be hasty of spirit. Now, there's several dangers when you get a hasty spirit. We mentioned one already. You make wrong choices. That's what Esau did. Proverbs 14, verse 17. The Bible says this, He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. He that is soon angry. You know what that means? He's got a short fuse. Okay? You're going to deal foolishly. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? Well, you don't remember him. You remember reading about him. And, and he was, when those Hebrew children wouldn't bow down to the idol, and he got angry. He got hasty in spirit. Remember what he told them to do to the furnace? What did he tell them to do to the furnace? Turn it up seven times hotter. What he wasn't thinking was how hot that's going to be. Because when the men, his own guys, took the Hebrew boys to throw them in there, what happened to them? They died from the heat. They were burnt. His hasty decision turned out, looked pretty foolish when the Hebrew boys are walking around in there and he's got dead guys laying around outside the furnace. That's foolish. You make wrong choices. His hastiness, his quickness to anger cost people their lives. I'll guarantee you the men we minister to in the prisons Many of them are there for this very thing, hasty in spirit. They, they were soon angry. And they did something that now they regret. They made the wrong choice. Something else that can happen when you have a hasty spirit, not only you make wrong choices, but you can lose friends. Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22, verse 24. Notice the Bible says this, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. This is, so, this, is so, this is the principle of this. You will become like the people you run with. You'll become like the people you hang around. You'll never be what you want to be. You will be like those you run with. Like those you choose to associate with. And so you learn, notice what it says. The Bible says, why don't you make friendship with an angry man? And remember, one who is hasty in spirit is the one who gets soon angry. And so he says, you don't make friendship with an angry man. With a furious man, you won't go. Why not, God? Because you'll learn his ways. That's why you'll become like them. Notice what it says, that you'll get a snare to your soul. The snare wasn't the, the trap you think of that, that closes on an animal's leg. The snare was, was sharp stakes that they would dig a pit and put sharp stakes in the bottom of it so when an animal falls into the pit, it would become impaled on those stakes and it will kill it. It wasn't designed to hurt the animal. It was designed to kill the animal. And so you can ruin friendships and hurt, hurt others. Wrong choices, lose friends, you can have negative health consequences by having a hasty spirit. Look at Proverbs 14 and verse 30. Proverbs 14 and verse 30. Notice what he says here. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. You know, doctors tell us that 80% of health issues are anger-related. It'll affect your health. Be, be cautious about getting hasty in your spirit and being soon angry. Don't be hasty in your ways or hasty in your words. Proverbs 29, verse 20, the Bible says, See thou a man hasty in his words, there's more hope of a fool than of him. Ecclesiastes 5, 2, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. How often have we been hasty to say something to God?
It's interesting in Habakkuk 1 and verse 6, God said this about when He talked about going to raise up the Chaldeans to chastise the Israelites. Here's what God said about the Chaldeans. I will raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. That's how He described the Chaldeans that is going to march through the breadth of the land and possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. <coughs> he says the Chaldeans, I, I characterize them as having a bitter and a hasty spirit. Oh, guard against the hasty spirit. But there's another spirit to guard against, and that's in Proverbs 16. Would you look there? Talking about your attitude now. Are you always in a hurry? Are you always in a rush? Guard against that. Let's not have a hasty spirit. But secondly, verse, six, verse 18 of chapter 16 of Proverbs, notice this. You know this verse. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. <coughs> Excuse me. God says here, guard against the haughty spirit. What's haughty? Proud. Haughty is having a high opinion of oneself. Not only a high opinion of yourself, but kind of a contempt for others. Not only do I think I know a lot, I don't think you know nearly as much as I do. See, that's a haughty spirit. Arrogance. Someone said, pride is the only disease that makes everyone sick but the one who has it. And uh, that's a true statement. Ask yourself, always ask yourself this question. Who do you allow to correct you? No one? You're headed for trouble when you do not allow no pastor, no parent, no teacher, no friend to ever correct you. A haughty spirit reveals that I'm always right. You can't ever tell me I'm wrong. You know, there's two ways to do things. My way and the wrong way. That's a haughty spirit. Be careful. You're headed for a fall. When it says a haughty spirit before a fall, it literally means to be degraded, to sink into disrepute or disgrace, to be plunged into misery. That's what a fall will do. And that's because you always have to be it guard against the haughty spirit where nobody can tell you you're doing something wrong. Okay? So don't, there are two spirits to guard against. What are they? A hasty spirit and a haughty spirit. And what kind of attitude should we have? What kind of spirit should we possess? You know what's great about the Bible? It doesn't just tell you what you shouldn't do. It tells you what you should do. And let's look at what the Bible says we should do. Look at Proverbs 16 again. Here's the first kind of attitude or spirit we ought to have. Verse 19, Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Here's a humble spirit. In Proverbs 29 and verse number 23, again, the Bible says this, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor will uphold the humble in spirit. Humble means low. Humble means modest. Humble means submissive as opposed to lofty or proud. Humble is Jesus taking that towel and girding Himself and then stooping down and washing the disciples' feet when none of those other 12 guys would do it to each other. They had to watch Jesus stoop down and do it. It, it is not thinking less of yourself. It is not thinking of self at all. Humility. Humility. It means I'm teachable. It means I'm correctable. It means I'm always willing to learn. I'm, I'm, I, I've been pastoring 36 years and, and been saved for over 50, 54 years, <clears throat> but I'm still learning. And, and there are times, um, oh, we, we talked, uh, I don't know when it was, it's been a few months, where did Dean go? There he is, back here. All right. I know he's not in his cage on Sunday night. Brother gets in there. But, uh, you know, we, uh, I made reference one time teaching. I don't know whether it was a sermon or whether it was a Sunday school lesson about, and I mentioned the glory of God filling the temple, and we called it Shekinah glory. 
I always called it Shekinah glory. That's what I've always heard. Never looked it up, never studied it myself, just that's what I heard. So, you know, and probably that guy said it because he heard someone before him say it. And Dean come and said, you ever check it out? Where that Shekinah, where Shekinah came from? Uh, it's not biblical. None at all. I learned something. So uh, you won't hear me refer to it as Shekinah glory anymore. That's not right. Now this morning I talked about uh, the, the, the sign. Uh, it said, what sign can I give? And, and I said the sign was a form of a punishment that he wouldn't be able to speak. Well, that wasn't the sign. Brother Linda would come up and he said, you know, the sign was, when he said, give me a sign, the, he said, I am the angel Gabriel sent from the presence of God. That's the sign. For not believing it, you're not going to be able to talk until the baby's born. That was his punishment. See? So, I learned something this morning. And I learned that Brother Lindemann listens to my lessons. No, I'm kidding. But uh, he's, uh, he's tuned in. But that's, that's good. You know? I want to I wanna be able to have a humble spirit. I want to be able to be corrected when I need to be corrected. And be willing to learn when I need to learn. Always willing to learn. It means when I have a humble spirit, it means I'll serve without needing recognition. I'll serve without needing to be noticed. Humble in spirit. I love this story about Booker T. Washington, the famous black educator. He took over the presidency of, is it Tuskegee? Tuskegee? T-U-S-K-E-G-E? Is that how you say that? What? Tuskegee? Tuskegee, okay. He took over Tuskegee Institute of Alabama. He's walking in an exclusive section of the town where he was stopped by a wealthy white woman. Not knowing Mr. Washington by sight, she asked him if he'd like to earn a few extra dollars by chopping wood for her. Because he had no pressing business at the moment, he rolled up his sleeves and proceeded to do the humble chore that she requested. When he finished, he carried the wood into the house and stacked it by her fireplace. A young girl recognized him and later revealed his identity to the wealthy woman. The next morning, the embarrassed woman went to see Mr. Washington at his office at the Institute and apologized profusely. She, he said, it's perfectly all right, madam. Occasionally, I enjoy a little manual labor. Besides, I always delight to do something for a friend. She shook his hand warmly and assured him that his humble and gracious attitude had endeared him and his work to her heart. Not long afterwards, she showed her admiration and appreciation by persuading some of her wealthy acquaintances to join her in donating thousands of dollars to the Institute. Humility. What kind of spirit do we avoid? A hasty spirit and a haughty spirit. What kind of spirit do we need and add to need? A humble spirit. A humble spirit. The second kind of spirit we need is a controlled spirit. Look at Proverbs 16, will you please? Proverbs 16, verse number 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Similar to this is Proverbs 25 and verse 28. Notice the scripture says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. That word rule there means has no control, no, no standard for conduct for his spirit. So we understand you, you need to have a controlled spirit. Now one of the one of the, the, the sad things that have come about in the various uh, new Bible translations that come out is when they list the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And a lot of your new versions, what they translate temperance as is, who knows, self-control. Do you know you have a very difficult time controlling self? In fact, you won't be able to control self. I know this. 
Can you control your tongue? No, God said the tongue can no man tame. If you have a controlled tongue tonight, it's because you've asked God to help you control that tongue. Only God's the one who can help you do that. But now when we talk about controlling our spirit, we're not talking about us being in control of the spirit as much as we are allowing our spirit to be controlled by God's spirit. Well, I allow my spirit to be under the control of God's spirit. Now, how do I do that? It all depends. How I do that is what I, what I focus on or what I will think on. That determines whether my spirit will stay under the control of God's spirit or whether it will come under the control of my soul. When the disciples were arrested in the book of Acts, they stood before the council and they said something very profound. They said, we can but speak the things which we have seen and heard. You think about that. We can only speak the things which we've seen and heard. You know what you talk about? The things you've seen and the things you've heard. So if I want to talk about things that are right and things that honor God, I have to be careful what I see and what I hear. You have somebody in a situation where they stub their toe or they you know, hammer the wrong nail or, or something happens and a curse word comes out. And they say, oh, I don't know where that came from. Well, I do. First of all, it comes from your heart. But it came in either through the eye gate or the ear gate. That's why you can't watch programming that has cursing in it and it not affect you. It, it's going in. And like the old country preacher said, what goes down in the well will come up in the bucket. And at some point, it's coming out. Usually when the contents get under pressure, then it comes out. And so we have to guard what we think. I yield my spirit to the Holy Spirit by controlling my thoughts. By making sure I think on the right things. Look at 2 Corinthians. We'll come back to Proverbs, of course. But look over quickly to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Are you all right? 2 Corinthians, I know it's a little warm in here tonight. We won't be, we won't be much longer. But let's, let's, let's look at what the Bible says here. 2 Corinthians 10. <coughs> now he's talking here about spiritual warfare. Though we, verse number 3 of 2 Corinthians 10, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now there's a parenthesis in verse 4. A parenthesis is a personal note from the author to the reader. God's giving us some insight here, okay? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. What does carnal mean? They're not fleshly. They're not after the flesh. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So we have weapons that we can use that are mighty through God that will pull down things that have set up a fortress in our mind. Hard to overcome. How does that happen? Verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God says we, we, get, we get imaginations or we get things that we know. When it says that it goes against the knowledge of God, it means it goes against what we know to be true about God. And when those things come into our mind, what do we do? Cast them out. We don't dwell on them. We don't call somebody else up and talk about them. We don't discuss them. We don't mold them over in our mind. We cast them out. Throw them away. Say, God, take those out of my mind. I'm not thinking about that. That is not true. I know that's not how you are. I'm not going to dwell on that. What am I going to do? I'm going to bring every, into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Why? Christ, let, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Go, the, let Christ control your mind. He'll 
cast out the wrong and that bring every thought to the obedience of Christ. When you do that, you'll be in control of your spirit. You'll allow the Holy Spirit to be in control of your spirit. That's what Philippians 4, 8 is about. Whatsoever things are pure and, and lovely and just and of good report. He said, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, do what? Think on these things. When I was growing up in my house, that verse was right next to the, believe it or not, some of you young people won't believe this, we used to have to get up and walk up to the TV to turn the channel. Uh, it was amazing. And uh, it was rough. We, you don't know how rough we had it in those days. <laughs> had to walk barefoot through shag carpeting to get to the TV, you know. And, um, but right beside that channel turner was that verse, Philippians 4.8. To remind us that in what I'm watching here, is it pure, is it lovely, is it just, is it of good report? Hmm? Good thing to put in your TV. Probably won't be on very much. But, but that's, that's how you control your thinking. A controlled spirit. So I'm going to have a humble spirit, I'm going to have a controlled spirit. Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11, please. Here's the third kind of spirit we want to have. Proverbs 11, notice with me verse 13. Proverbs 11, verse 13. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. A faithful spirit. The, the root word here really means to restrain. You know what it means? It means a faithful spirit means the bad stops with you. The bad stops with you. It means even though you know the bad, you won't repeat the bad. That means someone, someone shows up at church and they say, boy, man, wasn't it great to see so-and-so there? Man, he seems like a real nice guy. Well, yeah, I'm sure he is, but you know, you know he's an ex-con. Well, why do you have to say that? Hmm? Well, aren't they a wonderful couple? Well, you know, they're divorced and remarried. What's that got to do with it? What's it got to do with them being a lovely couple? You see, even though you know something, why do you feel like you've got to tell it? Hmm? Why don't you have a faithful spirit? Don't, don't get a bad attitude on me now, all right? I'm trying to help you. Faithful spirit. You don't need to repeat even truth if it's negative truth. That's going to hurt someone and not build somebody up. If it's not good to the use of edifying, then it doesn't need to be said. Have a faithful spirit. It's a restraining spirit. It means to conceal your thoughts and opinions. Boy, that's not easy in the America we live in today. Everybody, what do you think about that? What do you have to think about that? Let's hear what you have to say. It doesn't matter who talks or who speaks. Everybody wants to, let's open the phone lines and let's see what you're, you got. When the truth is, it doesn't matter what we think about it or what we got to say about it. But we get in that, that spirit. We avoid the hasty spirit, the haughty spirit. We try to cultivate a humble spirit, a controlled spirit, a faithful spirit, and then, fourthly, an excellent spirit. Proverbs 17, 27. Proverbs 17, 27. Talking about our attitude now. The Bible says, He that hath knowledge spareth his words. And a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. An excellent spirit knows when to speak and it knows when to be quiet. Daniel, the Bible says Daniel in Daniel 6.3 that he had an excellent spirit. You know what's going on in Daniel 6 in, in chapter 6? The... The king is thinking to set, 
set up the hierarchy of his kingdom. And he's going to set over all his provinces. I think there was 127 or so. And he's going to put three presidents over them. One of those three presidents is Daniel. And he thought over those three presidents, he'd probably make Daniel the chief. Well, there were some fellas, I'm sure, Chaldeans, or, uh, that, that didn't want that. Why? why? Why let this slave guy come in and rise to this level? So they're going to try to find something on him to make him disloyal to the king, to strip him of his position, to uh, put him down to size, so to speak. And they, they, they do all they can. They follow him around. They watch him. They talk to other people. They try to dig up all the dirt they can. They can't find anything. They, the, the, the biggest crime was he goes to his room and he prays three times a day. That's pretty incredible in itself. Do you think those fellows ever said anything bad about Daniel? Huh. I'm sure they, did. they tried all the time. I'm sure they tried to, to, to say, to slander him and say things, but you know what's great? Though they may have spoken evil about him, he never said anything bad about them. You, you'll have, you'd be surprised how excellent your spirit can be when you spare your words. Now, how do you spare your words to others? How do you, how do you not, you say, Pastor, how do you, how do you not say something when you, man, it's just inside and it's going to, I got to say something. How do you, how do you spare your words? You know how you spare your words? You don't spare your words with God. How could Daniel spare his words and not say anything to those guys? Because three times a day he talked to God. I would hesitate to say anything to somebody else until I know I've spent three hours in prayer, maybe. You know, sometimes people say, well, I really prayed about this. I, I really want them to translate what that means. What does really prayed about it mean? Did you fast and pray a night for it? Did you fast and pray for three days about it? What does that really mean? Daniel did three times a day. And he maintained an excellent spirit. That's what I want. But you don't get that if you don't spend time with God. You remember the verse about being friends with the angry man? Why shouldn't you be around people that are so angry like that? Because you'll learn their ways. You'll be like them. Because you become like the people you spend time with. Well, what happens if you spend time with God? You'll become like Him. It'll rub off. It'll have an effect on you. It'll, it'll give you that excellent spirit. And then lastly, this is good. Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15. Verse number 13. A merry heart doth good maketh heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. Verse fifteen: All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. The Bible says here we're, we're we're not to have a broken spirit. The sorrow of the heart brings a broken spirit, and the way to prevent the broken spirit is to have a merry heart. Another verse says, a merry heart doth good like a medicine. Well, how do you get a merry heart? How do you get a happy heart as a Christian? You know what Jesus told us? He looked at His disciples after He had washed their feet and talked to them in the upper room. John 13 and verse 17, He said, Fellas, if you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Do them. You're not happy because of the Bible you know. You're happy because of the Bible you live. A lot of folks who know the Bible, but they're not very happy. Because they're not living the Bible they know. And so you have to obey. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. A happy spirit. Following God. Obeying God. Listening to the Spirit of God. Doing what God wants and what God thinks and what God feels. 
When the Queen of Sheba came to, to look at Solomon, she'd heard about his greatness. And you read about it in Second Chronicles chapter 10, and she sees the coming in and going out of his servants. Her overwhelming impression was, happy are your servants. These people are happy serving you. I wonder if folks come and observe Bible Baptist Church and they just watched us for a week, would they go away saying, happy are the servants of God. Boy, they're happy serving the Lord. They're just happy in the service of the King. They have a happy spirit. Boy, I like that. Now, here's your question. How's your attitude? How's your spirit tonight? You're, you're responsible for your spirit. You're responsible for your disposition. And God says, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You can't push that off on anybody else. Well, if they wouldn't be this way, then I wouldn't have to. No, 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 no. Don't hide behind somebody else. Sometimes I'm happy. Sometimes I'm blue. My disposition depends on you. No, it doesn't. My disposition is going to depend on me. What did David... David asked God something in Psalm 51 when he confessed his sin. In verse number 10, he said, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Maybe some of us need to pray that prayer tonight. Lord, renew a right spirit within me. And let me have in me a humble spirit. Let me have in me a controlled spirit and a faithful spirit and an excellent spirit and a happy spirit. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Heavenly Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for instructing us <coughs> helping us that we might bring honor to you and glory to you not only in our body but in our spirit not only in what we do but the attitude we have when we do it not only in what we say but the attitude we have when we say things and Lord tonight our prayer would not just be to adjust our attitude, we would pray with David, renew a right spirit in me. And I pray that you would keep in our heart and in our mind this week, and yea, the remainder of our time on earth, that we would glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. How many folks tonight would say, Preacher, the Spirit of God has spoken to my spirit tonight. And I need Him to renew a right spirit in me. There's some things that need to be done and only God can do them. And I'm going to ask Him to give me a right spirit in me that I would glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which are God's. Pray for me tonight, Pastor. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. 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 God bless you. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have your invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him tonight. Have a, have a humble spirit. Don't, don't get a haughty or a hasty spirit. Have an excellent spirit. Have a happy spirit. Have an excellent spirit. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts. Lord, we, we don't just want to do the right things. We want to do them in the right way. We want to have that right spirit within us. That folks could see that we're happy in the service of the King. 
that it really is a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing we know. Father, have your way now in each heart and life. May each of us respond to what you've spoken to our hearts about this evening. And I'll thank you for it. 